Back in the early 90s, I was absolutely obsessed with Sharp. Around the age of 15, I was already playing lots of Warhammer, pretty much anything Games Workshop made. But I really got stuck into Bernard Cornwell's writing, loved all the books, read them in, in a pretty short period of time. Loved watching Sean Bean on the television. And I enjoyed it almost as much as Warhammer for a time. Didn't really game it too much. I did play a little bit of 6mm Napoleonics, but absolutely loved the period and it it went on to inspire me during my a levels and projects i chose including a level art studying some of the the paintings from the period long-term viewers of the channel will know that there's quite a lot of time spent messing around with warlord games epic battles and looking at large games of napoleonics but i haven't really gotten around to tackling napoleonics in 28 millimeter I wanted to do a skirmish game, but a very, very small scale skirmish game, just a handful of figures and haven't found anything that quite fitted that bill yet. Got some really, really good rules like sharp practice, that kind of thing. But I wanted something with almost single digit figures on the table and a little chat with uh, Peachy when he came on the hobby hour as a guest with myself and Dan. We talked a little bit about Silver Bayonet and I, it had been on my radar for a little while. So when Osprey got in contact and offered me the chance to review the new Canada supplement, I jumped at the chance. My name's Stuart, welcome to Miniature Realms, and in this video we're going to take a look at Silver Bayonet, all the rules and the supplements so far, with a bit of focus on the new Canada supplement, which is out later in the month. So as I've already mentioned, Osprey Games have very, very kindly sent me an early review copy of the Canada Supplement by Ash Barker. But before we take a look at that supplement, as I haven't covered Silver Bayonet on the channel before, I really wanted to provide a little bit of context and have an overview of the game. Silver Bayonet is a Napoleonic Gothic horror skirmish game by Joe McCulloch and published by Osprey Games. Set during the Napoleonic Wars alongside the horrors of war, a rise of the evil harvestmen becomes known. Their spirits or demons that feed on fear and horrors of the war, they turn to summon many evil creatures from myth and legend. There's an official range of miniatures available from North Star, but as many, many gamers will be well aware of, there's a huge range of 28mm Napoleonic figures available in the market, whether you're after traditional metals from the likes of Perry Miniatures and many, many other companies, to plastic miniatures, some of the multi-part also from Perry Miniatures, from Warlord Games, from Victrix, and so on and so on. Even Atlantic War Games have got some lovely plastic riflemen. The list is almost endless. This. The game is played on a relatively small board, generally two and a half or three foot square, and all you need is a little bit of Napoleonic themed terrain and up to eight soldiers aside. The game steps away from your regular D6 dice and uses a D10 with a standard deck of playing cards. It uses a few tokens in the form of clue markers and fatigue tokens, but these can be represented in a subtle way if you wanted to build your own custom objectives, that kind of thing. The core book has six nations, Austria, Britain, France, Prussia, Russia and Spain, but these are generally flexible. So, for example, if you wanted to play as Portuguese, you could use the list from Spain and so on and so on. The core stats or profile are speed, melee, accuracy, defense, courage, health and recruitment. And recruitment is a stat that's not used in the game itself. For the officers it shows how much you can spend on soldiers and for the soldiers it shows their individual cost. To create your unit you start with your officer. This is your representation on the tabletop. This is the leader of your small band of men. There's a baseline stat for your officer. Then you get to increase a couple of stats by your choice just to give you a little bit more of a bespoke feel to your leader. And after choosing your leader's equipment, you then move on to selecting your soldiers. You can have up to 10, but you're not allowed to exceed the 100 recruitment points that your officer gives you, with each nation having its own list of options. The core game book has a table of preset scenarios, but of course you can go on and make your own. Most work around clue markers, which essentially are objectives or points of interest, with the nature of these hidden until investigated. And then they are revealed via a table in the scenario using the standard playing deck cards. 
Most dice rolls are called checks. Players rolling two dice, one power and one skill dice, so it's useful to have two different coloured d10s. These results involve adding a specific sat to combine dice rolls with the individual power or skill results being used to determine the results such as damage. The Silver Bayonet uses an initiative system where the primary player has priority and must activate half of his soldiers first. After this, there's the monster phase where the monsters move, then the secondary player gets to move all his or her miniatures. After this, the primary player gets to remove the remaining miniatures that have not moved already. Specific dice rolls in the initiative phase can result in unexpected events and these are covered by rolling on further tables. Movement is in inches with simple rules for interacting with terrain. Melee and shooting is achieved via making checks and adding dice rolls to cause stats. For melee, this is at first an opposed roll, the winner of the highest total, then checking to see how much damage it caused, referring to the weapons table to see if the roll of the power or skill die is used. Shooting is handled in a similar way, but with the addition of a shooting modifier table, players are also required to reload weapons, adding extra realism and jeopardy to the game. Silver Bayonet also uses a fate pool mechanic, giving the player extra power, skill and monster dice. These can be used in the game to complete rerolls, negate damage, quick reload or force monsters to reroll checks. Monsters are not entirely controlled by either player. Monsters' actions are covered in a few simple activation rules based on monster type and weapons they may have. They generally either shoot, attack or move towards the nearest model or clue marker. Who wins the game is determined most often by achieving the scenario objectives or opponents having no models left. There are campaign rules with tables for injuries, deaths and madness. And the game also includes rules for solo play. I don't want to spoil any of the campaign or scenario, so I won't cover those in any detail at all, but needless to say they're all very well presented and the book looks fantastic. The first supplement for the game was the Carpathians and it focuses on some classic gothic tropes, haunted ruins, castles and graveyards and such. This adds new soldier scenarios and adds to the monster bestiary. It also contains two new narrative campaigns, the Iron Keep and the Broken Watchtower. That brings us nicely back to the latest supplement, the Silver Bayonet Canada, which is released on November the 23rd this year. So that's 2023 if you're watching this in the far future. This expansion is penned by no other than Ash Barker of Gorilla Miniature Games fame. If you're not aware of Gorilla Miniature Games, and I can't imagine you won't be, it's definitely one of the bigger channels in Wargaming YouTube. Go and check it out now, or at least at the end of the video. The channel is excellent, I've enjoyed it for years, Ash is super engaging, genuinely one of the best channels around. A huge range of games and topics covered as well but as you can imagine many videos donated to Silver Bayonet especially great if you want to check out gameplay after watching this. In this expansion we see the game travel to North America for the first time with the Harvestmen spreading their evil there. New factions or nations have been added with the United States, Upper Canada, Lower Canada and the trading companies joining the game. So in this supplement, we have four new soldier types. We've got the Discovery Serviceman, Luke Guru, Voyageur, and the Woodsman. Adventures in the North presents five new scenarios. Trade Routes, The Outpost, Wings of Sleep, The Serpent's Curse, and the 1812 Overture. There is also a three scenario solo campaign, The Long Night, where your unit is on the ship in the ice flows of King William Island, searching for another missing crew. The game finishes with an extension to the game's bestiary with eight new profiles. The first one, let's have some fun trying to pronounce that. The Babax, Walan Yuxwi, sorry about that, Grizzly Bear, Harvestman Agent, Harvestman Assassin, Moose, Polar Bear, Tazemus and the Wendigo. Like the other titles, the book is beautifully presented. The artwork is fantastic. Lovely black and white, really, really kind of atmospheric pieces. Some really, really spooky stuff. Really, really brings the idea of the game to mind as you're flicking through. It's very, very easy to read. There's not lots and lots of text squashed in on each page so it doesn't feel like a heavy slog to get through while reading. It's one of the good things about all of these publications. 
So I've got some plans for this game, and, and the reason I'm, I'm planning to, to delve into it is because it's such a low figure count investment. It's very, very easy to assemble a few miniatures or buy a few miniatures, paint up a unit and be ready to play the game. And that's something that I, I quite like these days. I've got a lot of big projects on the go as a war gamer. So a project where I can crack out eight models, paint them, put them away in the cabinet, and then I'm ready to play should I have time to crack out a game. I've got a box with a bit of a mixture of 28mm Napoleonics. I'm going to be delving through that and having a look at what to build. There's some Brigade Games not sharp models in there. They might be fun to build up and, and paint. There's also the Atlantic War Games Rifleman, which I can also build sharp and his, his friends from. And then lots of other things as well. So I'm definitely going to start with some British. I will build probably more models than I need, so I can build sort of multiple different builds. And I'm really sort of interested in, in trying the game out just to use as a standard Napoleonic skirmish game as well rather than having the, the monster element into it and just seeing how well the game stands up. I'm, I'm pretty sure it will. quite like the idea of recreating some of the small scenes from the, the sharp films where it's himself, Harper, a couple of chosen men and maybe a couple of other red coats from the light company just trying to attack a small farmhouse with some French in or something like that and I think that would be really fun. Very very quick games and that's exactly what I was after really when I was looking for this real small scale skirmish game so I'm hoping that it will do both things for me if I'm getting to use one set of rules to do both things that's good for my aging brain trying to remember rule sets I very much remember the last thing I've played and it pushes out all the other things I've done beforehand so not having to get my head around too many different sets of rules is really really good so let me know what you think. Have you already played this game? Is it something you're looking at picking up? Um, has this video helped at all? I mean, I haven't played the game yet. That's very apparent. But I really wanted to give it a little bit of an overview and, and tell you my thoughts about how it could be used. Obviously, as a game in itself, it looks fantastic. And I love the idea of playing in that fantastical alternate gothic napoleonic period and i'll definitely play some games like that i've got lots of miniatures that i can use for the game from my warhammer armies i've got some undead and things that i'll be building for mordheim even some of my terrain that i've built for mordheim will be perfect for this some of the buildings will work very very nicely and lots of the terrain will work very very nicely as well have any of you bought any of the North Star miniature sets? And what do you think of them? They look fantastic. And single piece metal miniatures. I don't always go for for gaming. I do like to build my own things, but they are also very tempting as well. But I think I'll start with kit bashing with some of the plastics and things that I already own. I definitely plan to cover this game more on the channel as well. And I think I'll start off by doing a painting video based around my first British figures that I build for my unit. And we'll see how it goes from there. Thank you very much for Osprey Games for sending me the review copy ahead of release. It's very, very nice for them to do so. And thank you very much for watching. Take care and I'll catch you soon.